After 18 years and nearly 150,000 lives lost, the United States seemed closer than ever to ending the war in Afghanistan after months of negotiations with the Taliban. But then in a tweet, President Trump called this off. Yeah, President Trump said he was canceling a planned summit with Afghanistan's President Ashraf Ghani and leaders of the Taliban. It was supposed to have happened yesterday at Camp David just days before the anniversary of the September 11th attacks. And Paris, Dia Hadid has been following all of this. She's based in Pakistan and joins us. Hi there, Dia. Good morning. Do you mind starting with the substance here? Like, what were these negotiations about? What did, what did it look like that, that might result from it all? Right. So these negotiations, they appeared to be finalized, according to the Taliban uh, spokesperson for negotiations. And roughly, it would have begun with uh, about 5,000 American troops withdrawing within five months from Afghanistan and shutting down five military bases. And there would have been more phased withdrawals after that. The Taliban were meant to agree that they, or t- to commit, that they wouldn't allow foreign militant groups to uh, plot uh, terror attacks um, in Afghanistan, and that they would sit with other Afghans to chart out a political future for the country. And that was set for September 23, that meeting. But now that doesn't look like it will happen either. Well, that, I mean, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. But it sounds like they were also meant to meet with President Trump earlier. Is that right? It's a remarkable and unconfirmed detail. The Taliban said that they'd actually been invited to meet President Trump at the end of August, but they'd refused on the basis that they wanted to sign an agreement first. And that's what led us to this meeting that was meant to happen on Sunday. I mean, we should say the idea of hosting the Taliban on, on U.S. soil <laughs> is is kind of stunning and, and totally unprecedented, right? It's Absolutely unprecedented. And it was met with criticism even among those in the president's party. A handful of Republican members of Congress did speak out over the weekend, and they were incredibly critical of the idea of hosting the Taliban. This would have also been shocking for Afghans. Consider the national security forces who were tasked with keeping the country together once foreign forces leave. More than 45,000 of them were killed over the past five years, largely at the hands of the Taliban. And It's hard to imagine how they would have perceived the president of the United States fating the very people who'd been out killing them. Hmm. Well, so what happens now? I mean, the U.S. Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, said that the Taliban has failed to live up to commitments they had made. I mean, is that why these talks have broken down? Well, so Pompeo's referring to the last Thursday bombing in Kabul that killed 12 people, including the American servicemen, but there was no commitment that we know of for the Taliban to halt attacks during the negotiations. In fact, there were deadlier attacks by the Taliban during this period, but they largely killed Afghan civilians. And those attacks had even seemed to have stepped up as the talks were winding down. And that could have been for leverage or for optics to show their people that they had kicked out the Americans. But there was also glow- growing political pressure on the tele- um, on President Trump by people like Senator Lindsey Graham and former ambassadors who'd served in Kabul, warning them that this deal risked igniting a total civil war. Wow. Okay. Um, that's NPR's Dia Hadid in Pakistan covering uh, these negotiations that have been called off uh, by President Trump for now that were supposed to happen, it sounds like, in Camp David over the weekend. Dia, thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you, David. All right, the effort to hold drug makers responsible for the country's opioid crisis accountable has intensified over the last year. A lot of the focus has been on a company called Purdue Pharma. This is the company that produced the opioid medication OxyContin. They are facing 2,000 lawsuits across the country alleging that they fueled the crisis. So the company's been in negotiations with state attorney generals to reach some kind of settlement. Now, though, it it turns out those talks have reached a stalemate and Purdue Pharma is expected to file for bankruptcy. North Country Public Radio's Brian Mann uh, has been covering uh, all the various chapters in this opioid litigation for NPR and joins me on Skype. Hi there, Brian. Hi, David. So what exactly were these talks meant to accomplish here with Purdue Pharma? Yeah, so this is a very complicated moment when the company and its owners, members of the Sackler family, have signaled that they want a national settlement, something that would cap their total liability for their role in this epidemic. We've heard payouts could run as high as 10 to $12 billion. 
But in this latest round of talks, state attorneys general demanded that the Sacklers commit to paying roughly $4.5 billion out of their own personal fortunes as part of the compensation. The attorneys general say the Sacklers refused to give that commitment. Uh, Here's Josh Stein. He's attorney general for the state of North Carolina. We needed more security on the part of the Sacklers that the money that they were pledging, they would in fact pay. Uh, And we didn't have that commitment. And the Sacklers rejected those proposals. The, the deal was there to be made, uh, and they refused. And so this is where we find ourselves. Okay, well, where where do they find themselves? Where do they find themselves? I mean, what happens now that the Sacklers are refusing here? Right, so Stein and other members of his negotiating team predict Purdue Pharma will now file for bankruptcy protection imminently. In an email they sent Saturday that was obtained by NPR, they said states across the U.S. are already preparing for that bankruptcy to happen uh, Purdue has signaled in the past bankruptcy is one option they're considering. The company's declined to say whether this is in fact imminent, but Purdue Pharma did send NPR a statement last night saying they still hope to negotiate some kind of deal. In fact, they say talks with some government officials, possibly local government leaders, are continuing. But if you have been victimized in the opioid crisis, if you are someone like a state suing this company, you hear the word bankruptcy, and I mean, that, that could have a lot of implications for whether these lawsuits might might go forward, right? Yeah, it, this could be chaos. I mean, it, it might take years to sort out in bankruptcy what assets remain, what their value is, and, and then who's first in line for compensation. Meanwhile, th- these lawsuits are happening fast. A major federal trial involving Purdue Pharma and 20 other drug companies is scheduled for next month in Ohio. And Brian, just remind me about the Sacklers. I mean, they are probably one of the richest and also most controversial families in the United States. I mean, what what happens to them here? Yeah, so there's a legal argument being made by some states that the Sacklers effectively stripped billions of dollars out of Purdue Pharma over the years, uh, and and now they want to claw some of that money back. Uh, here again is Josh Stein. He's attorney general in North Carolina, saying they're going to be suing the Sacklers directly. Many states like mine uh, will be filing lawsuits against the Sacklers in their individual capacity. Uh, I think almost more than any other family and company, uh, they have to wear that burden. Yeah, so basically what we're hearing is that the legal trouble, even if bankruptcy happens, the legal troubles for the Sacklers, those are very likely to continue. Brian Mann has been covering the opioid litigation for NPR. Brian, thanks as always. Thank you, David. All right, we're going to turn now uh, to the Bahamas again. We have a reporting team from NPR on the ground there reporting on the communities that were just devastated by Hurricane Dorian. Yeah, a week after the storm made landfall, conditions are growing increasingly dire. Food is scarce. Water and other supplies are rapidly running out as residents on the Apico Islands and Grand Bahama are just desperately waiting to get evacuated. And it's not clear when they'll come back, if they're ever going to come back. The death toll now stands at 44 people, and that is expected to rise. NPR's Jason Bobian has been leading our reporting team there and joins me now. Hi, Jason. Hey, David. So you, as I understand it, are just outside Marsh Harbor. That's the the real commercial hub on the Abaco Islands, right? Um, I mean, just take us there. What, what are you seeing, and, and how are how are people still there even holding up? I mean, people are, especially here, are really trying to get out. It's particularly more here, I think, than in Grand Bahama. Uh, Marsh Harbor is completely flattened. Uh, you know, there, you look around, there, you don't even see any houses that didn't suffer damage. A lot of things are just completely destroyed, and it's even hard to find people. It's actually interesting. Over the time we've been here, things have gotten sort of calmer because there are fewer and fewer people around. This is an island of 17,000 people. Thousands have already left. Um, one official I managed to find was a guy who used to be the, the head of the Chamber of Commerce, this guy, Vadu Boodle, and um, he's basically saying that you know nothing is operating here right now. Zero commerce. Zero commerce at this time. There's nothing. You can't buy water. You can have as much money as you want. You can't buy anything here. He is saying that, and that is an accurate description, you cannot buy anything. There are no stores open whatsoever. So everything is going to have to be brought in. Mm. All right, so zero commerce. It's hard to find even people. Um, Are there recovery efforts happening? I mean, are you seeing some activity in that regard at all? 
I, so at this point, this has moved over to, you know, search and rescue teams going door to door searching for bodies. They are going, there are some teams out of Gainesville, Florida, teaming up with the Bahamian police, and they're, they're going in, and they are blunt about it that they are going and they are just smelling for the smell of, of rotting corpses at this point. And if, if they, they believe the bodies are in there, they mark it in a certain way. If not, they mark them clear, and they move on uh, uh, to the next one. I was talking to one Bahamian police officer yesterday. He says they expect more heavy equipment to help them in some of the areas that are they, they know there are bodies hidden inside some of this, this rub it, r- rubble, and they're going to try to get them out of there. I mean, I, ju- I just think about what you're describing in a, in a community suffering through this. It, it, there's no sign that these storms are going to get any less destructive in coming years, maybe worse. Just the scale of what you're seeing, like, is it feasible for islands like this to, to, recovery, to recover like every few years if they have to go through this? I mean, absolutely, this is one of the questions that's out here is like, how do you deal with a a time when you might be getting more and more storms like this? Um, You know, this is going to take years for for Abaco and for Grand Bahama to recover. And uh, yeah, it's 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 the new reality. It's NPR's Jason Bobian, who is part of an NPR reporting team. Uh, He's talking to us from Abaco Islands uh, in the Bahamas. Thank you, Jason. You're welcome. So what now? For more than a year, a U.S. team led by Ambassador Zalmay Khalilzad has been working on a peace deal with the Taliban in order to bring U.S. troops home. Now President Trump says those negotiations are over. Now, I mean, President Trump has used this kind of absolutist language before in foreign policy. Just think about North Korea, only to then reverse course. But this whole thing has complicated matters for the U.S. military. There are still 14,000 American troops on the ground in Afghanistan. Are they going Are they staying? And if so, for how long? And what about Afghans themselves? Where is the democratically elected Afghan government in all of this? We've got NPR's national security correspondent Greg Myrie in studio this morning. Hi, Greg. Hey, Rachel. Lots of questions to answer. Let's start with the administration. Now that President Trump has called off these peace talks, what options does he have right now? Well, he does have options, but they're not very appealing. Uh, The U.S. military and the Afghan army could step up attacks on the Taliban, and we've heard something to that effect in recent days. Mm-hmm. But there's no reason to believe this is going to change a war that's that's been stalemated for years. Now, the president doesn't need a permission slip from the Taliban to withdraw troops. He right. could do that unilaterally, but this would only further reduce uh, U.S. leverage if they're trying to gain concessions from the Taliban. Um, he could also try to restart negotiations, but this could be very difficult. I spoke uh, about this with Dan, Feldham, who, Dan Feldman, who was the U.S. envoy to Afghanistan and Pakistan under President Obama. There's broad, uh, I think, political support for for concluding the war. But I think you've also seen just over the last few weeks the series of stakeholders who are concerned about the way in which it is done. Now, Feldman is referring to everyone from the Afghan government, which was not included in the talks, mm-hmm. to members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, uh, former U.S. military commanders and diplomats. All of them have, in their own ways, been critical. I mean, it's notable that the Afghan government hasn't been involved, right? Because the Taliban wants a political solution. The U.S. can't give them that. That's got to come from the Afghan government which is in itself in transition. There's an election coming up in Afghanistan, right? That's right. And it's going to be a very big test. The presidential election is set for September 28th, less than three weeks away. Um, If the government canceled this, it would look weak, not in charge. It would add to the uncertainty we're already seeing. And President Ashraf Ghani really wants uh, a mandate and another term in office. So he's really pushing to to have this election. And and regular elections have been one of the achievements, uh, one of the real signal achievements uh, Uh, that Afghanistan can claim. So postponing it would be a setback. But we could also be looking at a very bloody uh, period. The Taliban may want to step up attacks to show that the the, the power that they still have. Um, You may not get a clean, decisive uh, uh, election here. You'd have a runoff. So you could be looking at months and months of a very messy situation. Tomorrow uh, is going to mark 18 years since 9-11. Is the Taliban today different from the group that harbored al-Qaeda in 2001? Not fundamentally. I mean, it still wants to lead a country they want to call the Islamic Emirate of of Afghanistan. Some tactical changes. Uh, They don't want to lead a bank 
bankrupt, isolated country, uh, but they still want to lead a country under Sharia law. Mm, which would be a difference from the democratically elected government there. So what about the troops? An estimated 14,000 American troops are on the ground in Afghanistan. Are they clear on their mandate right now? Their mandate hasn't changed, and they provide these very important functions of uh air power to go after the Taliban, intelligence, things the Afghans can't do on them, uh, themselves. But um, they uh, are facing a very difficult period we, where we could see stepped up violence. So the mandate hasn't changed, but it's a very risky period we're entering. All right. NPR's Greg Myrie for us this morning. Greg, thank you. Thank you. Next, an NPR exclusive about the high-stakes settlement talks involving Purdue Pharma, which is the maker of OxyContin. Right. So yesterday, we told you that state officials are demanding compensation for the company's role in the deadly opioid epidemic. Those negotiations had reached a standstill, and it looked like the company was going to declare bankruptcy. Well, now, for the first time, the company is offering details of its offer to pay out billions of dollars to help communities struggling with the addiction crisis. North Country Public Radio's Brian Mann has been reporting on this and joins us now. Uh, so you've got this story, Brian. You've been in contact with Purdue Pharma. What have you learned? Yeah, so, you know, we've been reporting on these national talks, and Purdue Pharma has refused to give interviews or answer questions. And then yesterday, Rachel, after we talked about this here on Up First, the company suddenly sent an email to NPR and for the first time, they and their owners, the Sackler family, outlined publicly what they're offering to essentially cap their liability and resolve all these lawsuits uh, in one big deal. And, and here's what they say. The yeah. Sacklers are offering to give up the entire value of their main company, Purdue Pharma. It's a company with annual revenues around $3 billion. They've also an, offered another $3 billion in cash. And they say they would forfeit income from the sale of an overseas subsidiary called Mundi Pharma, which they claim is worth another $1.5 billion. Hmm. So until now, uh, the Sacklers, Purdue Pharma in general, they've declined to comment, confirm any of the details, as you've noted. Why are they sharing now? Yeah, the company's pretty clear in this email that they're offering details in order to dispute an account of these really contentious settlement talks given by state attorneys general over the weekend. Those government officials who are suing Purdue Pharma told NPR that they demanded guarantees from the Sacklers that at least $4.5 billion would come from their personal wealth. In other words, they want any settlements to drain some of this huge private fortune the family amassed by selling opioids. The attorneys general said the Sacklers declined to make that commitment. And, and here's what North Carolina's attorney general, Josh Stein, said yesterday here on the podcast. We needed more security on the part of the Sacklers that the money that they were pledging, they would in fact pay. Uh, and we didn't have that commitment. And the Sacklers rejected those proposals. But in this email to NPR, a top Purdue Pharma official, Josephine Martin, pushed back against Stein, arguing that all the assets being offered in this settlement are privately owned by the Sackler family and their members. Why does it matter, though, Brian? I mean, if there's settlement money on the table that's going to help communities that are struggling, have got a lot of people who are struggling with addiction, why does it matter if it comes from directly from the Sacklers or for, from the company? Right. So the Sacklers are one of the wealthiest families in the U.S. until recently known mostly for their philanthropy, you know, supporting museums and medical schools. But documents released over the last year have shown that they pushed hard to boost the sale of opioids, including OxyContin, and often downplayed the risk, even as their own researchers were raising fears about the high potential for addiction and overdose deaths. And now, you know, more 200,000 Americans have died from prescription opioid overdoses. So government officials who are at the negotiating table here with the Sacklers, they're under a lot of pressure to show that the family is going to feel some real financial pain from this process. The Sacklers saying they've offered to do that, to pay billions of dollars, but state attorneys general saying that's not enough. Hmm. One question, Rachel, Purdue Pharma hasn't answered is whether they will now file for bankruptcy if some kind of deal isn't reached. All right, Brian Mann with uh, that NPR exclusive. Brian with North Country Public Radio. He covers opioid litigation. Brian, thanks. Thank you, Rachel.
Now to the seemingly never-ending saga about a president, a hurricane, the state of Alabama, and an unsuspecting Sharpie. Right. And just in case you haven't been following Sharpie news, to recap here, President Trump insisted that Hurricane Dorian was threatening the state of Alabama. And then he held up this map, which according to reports, had been altered with a black marker to enlarge the area forecast to be hit by the storm. Now, the Commerce Secretary has gotten involved, and the whole thing is raising questions about how this administration uses political power to protect President Trump. And PR Media correspondent David Folkenflick is with us this morning. Hi, David. Hey, Rachel. All right. So can you just explain um, what happened? What what do we know and, and what is being disputed by federal scientists? Sure. Well, look, this is one of those things which actually is pretty serious right now. But putting on my media critics hat, I'd say it started as kind of a typical Trumpist in a tweet pot. You know, it was a gaffe that might have been overcovered. If you go back to September 1st, uh, a little before 11 a.m., Trump tweets that Alabama was among the states that's going to be hit hard by what he said, a hurricane five, you know, one of the hardest on record. 20 minutes later, folks at the Birmingham National Weather Service said, not so. System was too far away to do damage to Alabama. It's all fine. may well have been based on some maps showing some tropical wind gusts might hit Alabama in an outdated map. September 4th, President uh, Trump has that Sharpie uh, enhanced map. Who enhanced it? Who knows? But we do know the president loves Sharpies. Uh, And then... uh, you know, then it gets serious. Then a rear admiral who's Trump's uh, counterterrorism advisor comes out and, uh, with a statement saying he had given the president a briefing, uh, briefing showing that. On September 6th, uh, the, NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, sends out a statement basically rebuking the Birmingham National Weather Service in Alabama, saying it was inconsistent with probabilities from best forecasts. And let's remember- Saying NOAA that essentially and, that the president is right. You yeah, Alabama weather officials are wrong. Up. Yeah. And let's remember, these are proudly scientific agencies, NOAA and the National Weather Service. It's really important they have their independence so people can make their best judgments on their safety. Uh, businesses rely on outfits like this. And this seemed to be bent to try to prove the president right after the fact. But now Wilbur Ross is involved, the Commerce Secretary? <sighs> So look, you know, what we saw on Sunday was that the acting chief scientist of NOAA, uh, which is the parent agency, the National Weather Service, said, uh, hey, uh, I'm going to review whether there was any political interference. And yes, it appears as there are allegations first reported by the New York Times that the Commerce Secretary, which is over, who is over all of this stuff, personally got involved and said heads are going to roll at NOAA, at the National Weather Service for contradicting the president. It is uh, it triggered uh, uh, the review by the acting chief scientist. It's triggered apparently an inspector general's a review, you know, the question of whether or not uh, the these agencies are being allowed to operate uh, free of partisan involvement. So this is now about the president's handpicked cabinet member pressuring federal non-political scientists that know to change the facts. That's the allegation. The Commerce Secretary has uh, has had a spokesman denied that. But I think this is also about the larger issue about whether or not the Trump administration is going to allow information long prized by independent scientists, not partisan figures that help to inform Americans and their institutions to help them make good decisions, whether that is going to be bent to a personal uh, peak and uh, partisan intent in a way that uh, you know cuts against how the federal government is supposed to work. NPR, NPR's David Falkenflick for us on this story. Uh, David, we appreciate it. Thank you. You bet. How does a change in White House personnel affect the prospects for war or peace? President Trump fired his national security advisor yesterday. They parted because of their very different views of the world. The president acknowledged these differences from the moment that he hired John Bolton back in 2017. He said Bolton was partial to taking a hard line against U.S. adversaries. John Bolton is absolutely a hawk. It's up to him. He'd take on the whole world at one time, okay? But that doesn't matter because I want both sides. The president has wanted to pressure rivals, but also cut deals with them. Our White House correspondent, Franco Ordonez, has been covering this story. He's in our studios. Good morning. Good morning. What are some of the issues or parts of the world where their differences became apparent? Well, there were several. I talked with Fernando Coutts, who served as a senior director at the National Security Council until last year. He said Bolton never fully bought in to some of the president's key foreign policy issues. North Korea, he was against uh, dialogue uh, with Kim Jong-un. On Iran, he was the one advocating for the strike that the president pulled back from in the last minute. Uh, And most recently in Afghanistan, he opposed the talks with the Taliban. So so I think you see that, uh, you know, they they just weren't meshing. Wow, that's a lot. Let's take those again one (laughs) by one. He's against, Bolton was against dialogue with Kim Jong-un of North Korea? Right. I mean, Bolton previously uh, talked about 
overthrowing the North Korean leaders. Trump, as we know, wanted TV summits. He wanted to meet with Kim Jong-un. And it got so bad at the last time that they met, Bolton was actually sent on a trip to Mongolia. Hmm. Go to somewhere else in the world. Uh, He was also against the peace initiative, peace talks with the Taliban. Yeah, that may actually have been the last straw Trump had invited, and as we know, and later disinvited the Taliban to come to Camp David to see if a peace deal could be reached Um, in Afghanistan. Bolton argued against this, and the coverage kind of rankled Trump and others. Uh, And 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 this is this could have been the thing that really pushed it over the edge. Your analyst also mentioned Iran. Yeah, Iran was a big one. You know, on on one hand, Trump and Bolton were kind of aligned on getting out of the international nuclear deal, but again, Bolton was more hawkish than Trump was comfortable. Bolton favored a strike on Iran in retaliation for some of the provocations, such as shooting down a drone, but Trump instead canceled that strikes and said he want he would even be willing to meet with the Iran leaders under no preconditions. So we can easily think of John Bolton as a hawk, as they say, someone who wants to take a hard line, someone who's willing to use military force. We can easily think of President Trump as someone who wants to cut deals or make peace. But is it really that simple? Was it that simple all the time? Uh, not all the time, but look, for a long time... He- Bolton was, uh, you know, was was always a hardliner. He pushed for the U.S. invasion of Iraq when he was part of the George Bush administration. Trump, on the other hand, campaigned about getting out of endless wars. Did Bolton ever prevail? On many issues that were important to him, the answer is basically no. But on some domestic issues, he did. He did help with, you know, President Trump in uh, Florida on some political issues, pushing for, uh, you know, votes in South Florida after giving a very uh, fiery speech on Venezuela. Obviously, they agreed on Iran, uh, on the nuclear pact deal particularly. If he was losing most of the time, though, on substantive issues, does it matter much that he's gone? Well, I mean, in some cases, maybe not. It is Trump's presidency, but also this could give, you know, a bit more power to the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, who is often at odds uh, on some of these key foreign policy issues, such as foreign, such as North Korea. But we'll see who replaces him. And in the end, it really, as you say, it's about President Trump. He's the one with the last word. Franco, thanks so much. Thank you. That's NPR's Franco Ordonez. A U.S. military court at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, faces criticism from the inside. Yeah, it comes from a lawyer who worked there. The United States built a court and a prison on a naval base in Cuba. Construction started after the 9-11 attacks, which we should note happened 18 years ago today. The prison was supposed to house terror suspects from around the world and in some cases put them on trial. NPR has learned the lawyer has filed a federal whistleblower complaint alleging gross waste of funds and gross mismanagement. The whistleblower spoke with Sasha Pfeiffer of NPR's investigations team who's in our studio. Good morning. Good morning. Who's this whistleblower? His name is Gary Brown. He's a retired Air Force colonel and he was a career military lawyer. Hmm. And for from 2017 to 2018, he was legal advisor to the man who used to run Guantanamo's military court. Okay, so this is a guy who was inside the system, and what does he say about it? He said that when he got there, he was very surprised by the lack of progress in about 18 years, only one finalized conviction, and the expense of the place. I mean, over about 17, 18 years, it's been $6 billion. He felt like a lot of that was waste. Uh, Here's what he has to say about what he saw of spending. It's a lot of money. Half a billion dollars is a lot of money. And uh, if we're spending that much money year after year, we ought to see some results. That figure you just gave, half a billion dollars, is that an annual spending figure these days? In some years, the spending has been more than half a billion dollars, correct, on the military court and the prison there together. Where does that money go? You know, it's a gigantic operation down there. They have many, many lawyers. They have translators. They have linguists. They have court reporters, investigators, expert witnesses, tons of money spent on travel getting there and back. They have to fly to Cuba every time they want a hearing. Construction, housing, vehicles. It's just a massive amount of money. Taxpayer-funded charter planes. They're sometimes not that full because they have to get people down and back Hmm. uh, very quickly. So it's a giant amount of money, and and it's just been going on for almost 20 years. It's almost like they have to have their own airline to service this. Government charter planes taking people down. Prison and court and so forth. But there is another issue, according to your reporting, that actually got this guy fired, he says, that is not just about money, although it affects the cost, but it's also about a question of life or death. What was it? Yes. So the issue is that some of these prisoners are facing 
the death penalty. And Gary Brown believes that it's probably unlikely that prosecutors can de- get death penalty convictions or that they might be overturned. And he says, all right, then, and the other issue here is that even if there are convictions, the appeals process is probably going to take 15 years, he says, and cost another $1.5 billion. Wow. Now, meanwhile, if they are found not guilty at trial, the government has said, we can keep them locked up indefinitely anyway. So Gary Brown's point is basically, why are we doing this? Why don't we take the death penalty off the table, have them plead guilty in return for life in prison, and then we can speed the process up and try to shut the military court down. When he said that, while he was inside the system, what happened to him? He, they did actually start plea negotiations. They were fired, and he believes the reason they were fired is they become some, some government officials believe the death penalty or nothing for these, these terrorists, these alleged oh, so terrorists. so Brown tried to proceed without the death penalty, and he was effectively overruled. Correct. And he said lost his I've job. I've spoken to lawyers, top lawyers for all of these six death penalty uh, defendants, and they have said negotiations had been initiated, but then they were fired. Before What's they the Pentagon say about this this complaint? Not a lot. I asked for the past month for someone to speak with me on tape, and they said they couldn't provide anyone. Uh, they've, the numbers they've given have changed over time. It's hard to get reliable numbers out of them, so they haven't said much. Sasha, thanks so much. You're welcome. That's NPR's Sasha Pfeiffer, and you can find more on this story at npr.org. Israel's prime minister has sharpened his promise to promise to annex part of the West Bank. Yeah, he has made this promise as he seeks re-election. Uh, Netanyahu has talked about this before in his campaign. Now he's being more specific, though, saying which land Israel would claim first. The promise and resulting criticism come just weeks before uh, Israelis vote, actually next week, their second election of the year. Benjamin Netanyahu once again trying to keep his job. NPR's Daniel Estrin is covering this story. Daniel, good morning. Good morning to you. So what is the more specific promise? Well, he's saying that if he wins re-election and forms a government, Israel would immediately apply sovereignty over a long stretch of the West Bank, uh, the Jordan Valley, and the Northern Dead Sea area. That's about 30% of the West Bank. And many Israelis will tell you this is a strategic area important to Israel's security. And Netanyahu says this would establish a permanent eastern border for Israel. And he's saying that with his close ties to Trump, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to do something like this. So let's just record Call. This is land that Israel captured in a war in 1967. Uh, the United Nations regards it as occupied land, uh, has had an expectation for a long time that Israel would give it back in some way, subject to negotiations. So what would be the significance if Israel instead said a big chunk of the West Bank, not all of it, but a big chunk of it, would just be part of Israel? Right. Well, I mean, Israel does already occupy the area, but like you say, this would declare that Israel's presence there is permanent. And the possibility of a two-state solution to this conflict, uh, having Palestine along Israel, is already dwindling. But this plan by Netanyahu could make it even trickier to achieve. You'd have Israeli territory completely surrounding the west of the, the rest of the West Bank. You'd have tens of thousands of Palestinians inside the area that Netanyahu wants to annex, and they'd need passageways in and out. Very complex. And we're hearing lots of opposition already to this plan. Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the UN are objecting. The Palestinian leader is saying if Netanyahu pulls this off, that he would call off all existing agreements with Israel. Now, uh, like you say, if Netanyahu actually does this, it would go against this position of the world, most of the world, that the fate of the West Bank should be decided in peace talks. Would Netanyahu really go through with this last minute election promise? That's a very good question. It's it's days now before the last before the election. And last election, last spring, he gave this similar promise to start annexing Jewish settlements in the West Bank. Um, his rivals are saying, Netanyahu, you know, you've been in office for 10 years straight. Why wait with a plan until a week before elections? Um, you are just trying to attract right wing voters. That's what they're saying. And uh, Netanyahu, according to polls, could once again fail to secure a majority in parliament. So that could be fatal to his political career and making this kind of a promise is something that uh, could help him. President Trump has been very vocally supportive of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Is the president supportive in this case? Very curious, Steve, because the Trump administration didn't reject Netanyahu's announcement. It didn't welcome it either. And you really have to wonder if Trump would back such a thing. Um, The administration says they're about to present its peace plan after Israeli elections. And perhaps Trump could say, well, here's my peace plan. Please hold off Israel on any unilateral moves. Daniel, thanks for the update. Really appreciate it. 
You're welcome. That's NPR's Daniel Estrin. The southern border is effectively closed to the vast majority of migrants who are seeking asylum in the U.S. We say that after a ruling by the Supreme Court. The court temporarily upheld new rules by the Trump administration. They can take effect while a lawsuit plays out. Under these rules, the U.S. can reject asylum seekers unless they have first applied for asylum in a country they crossed on the way to the United States. That rule affects Central Americans who commonly do cross Mexico and possibly other nations before reaching the U.S. southern border. NPR's Joel Rose covers immigration and is in the studio this morning with us. Hi, Joel. Hey, Rachel. So this is going to have an immediate effect on a lot of people who are waiting for asylum right now, isn't it? It will. I mean, tens of thousands of migrants have been coming to the U.S.-Mexico border each month all year long. Most of them, as you say, Steve, from Central America, but also Cuba, Africa, South America. They're fleeing from violence and poverty to seek asylum in the U.S. And this Supreme Court ruling effectively means that those who've arrived since this new policy was announced in July can now be turned back with Hmm. very few exceptions. So a migrant from Guatemala, for example, would first have to apply for asylum in Mexico and have their claim denied there before applying for asylum in the U.S. This new policy had been largely held up in court since it was announced. Shortly after the ruling last night, the administration said it plans to begin implementing it as soon as possible. So why? Right. This is a huge departure from how the United States has historically approached asylum cases. Why does the Trump administration say it needs to make this change? Well, the administration has been complaining for years that the asylum system is broken, that migrants know that if they come here and ask for asylum, they'll be able to stay in the U.S. possibly for years while their claims work their way through the courts, even if those cases are unlikely to succeed in the end. And the administration has tried a whole range of tactics to deter migrants from coming. Many of those tactics have been struck down in court, including once by the same judge who initially blocked this policy. So this is really big. The president and other members of his administration put out tweets and statements last night hailing this as a major win. I mean, we should just say the Trump administration already passed a different rule that says people waiting for asylum have to wait in Mexico, right? Not in the U.S. This is on top of of that rule, making it even more difficult, if not impossible, for a lot of people to get asylum. Uh, The other side? I mean, what are immigration rights advocates telling you? They're pretty deflated. They say this policy turns its back on decades of asylum policy and that U.S. immigration law is pretty clear that it does not matter how you got to the U.S., you can still ask for asylum here. And that's why they challenged this policy in court. At first, it looked like they would win. A judge in California blocked the policy, saying it was, quote, inconsistent with federal law. He issued a nationwide injunction. But now the Supreme Court has stayed that injunction, so the policy is is going to take effect. Although here's, there's still a final, final decision to come, right? Well, there is, but here's legal alert from the ACLU, which initially challenged the policy in court. We are looking at a potentially devastating situation at the southern border. People are fleeing serious danger, and now they will not be allowed to apply for asylum. We are going to continue fighting. This is an unfortunate setback. But we have to keep fighting because the practical impact is enormous. The ACLU says this case isn't over. I mean, as you point out, um, you know, this this still has to play out in the lower courts um, before it it may go back to the Supreme Court. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, immigrant rights advocates have to be worried now that even if they can prevail in those lower courts, they're going to lose at the Supreme Court anyway, because we know there are at least five justices who voted to let this policy take effect right now. And Pierre's Joel Rose, who covers immigration for us. Joel, uh, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. President Trump famously once said trade wars are easy to win. At the moment, he is finding it easier to pause. The president has repeatedly announced tariffs and repeatedly put them off amid fears of further economic damage. This week, both countries are backing off of a trade war. China waived tariffs on some U.S. goods, and then President Trump delayed tariffs against Chinese goods that were planned for October 1st. That date is significant. It is the 70th anniversary of the founding of the Communist People's Republic of China, so the president cast this delay as an act of goodwill. And Pierre Scott Horsley is with us this morning. Hi, Scott. Good morning, Rachel. Why is everyone playing nice all of a sudden? 
it is a little odd to see a U.S. president taking note of the communist anniversary. Maybe more importantly, the next round of U.S.-China trade talks is set to get underway here in Washington in early October. Mm -hmm. And it would have been a little awkward had the U.S. set the table for those talks by increasing tariffs on some $250 billion worth of Chinese imports just a few days earlier. Not the friendliest way to open up negotiations. So what we have now is Trump postponing the effective date of those tariffs until October 15th, presumably after the talk. So the tariff threat still hangs out there as kind of a stick to Mm -hmm. encourage a settlement. And as you and Steve noted, we've seen this before where the president threatens new or higher tariffs, but then blinks as the talks approach. Right. But uh, China's also easing its grip. What were some of the, the American goods the Chinese suspended tariffs on? The tariff waivers that China announced yesterday were pretty minor. Uh, They apply to things like industrial Greece, uh, less than $2 billion worth of goods overall, not the marquee U.S. exports like soybeans and, and pork. Nevertheless, U.S. investors were happy to see any sign of de escalation in the trade war, and we saw another rally on Wall Street yesterday. Let's just take a second and step back because this whole thing, you can get lost in the politics and the rhetoric and the back and the forth, but it, it's taken a real toll on both economies. It is. Uh, President Trump has been tweeting about how much this is costing China's economy, but it's costing the U.S. too. Uh, exports from the United States have been lower than last year every month since March, uh, and manufacturing in particular has, has seen a lot of fallout from this trade war. Manufacturing is a, still a pretty small part of the overall U.S. economy, but it is concentrated in the kinds of areas that are politically important to President Trump. When you couple that with the damage that's been done in farm country by this trade war, Mm -hmm. another important political constituency for the president, you can see why it might be in the president's political interest to pause here. So do you have high hopes, Scott Horsley, for the trade talks that are coming up? Well, remember, Rachel, the U.S. launched this trade war calling for big changes in China in things like intellectual property protection and an end to the forced transfer of U.S. technological Mm know-how. But economist David Dollar, who's a former Treasury and World Bank expert on China, says at this point that kind of grand agreement is not likely. I think the best we can hope for at this point is a mini-deal. But the real ultimate deal that both sides are looking for seems that two sides are far apart for that kind of comprehensive agreement. Maybe some relaxation of tariffs, maybe some additional purchase of farm goods by China, but no real progress on what started this trade war in the first place. All right, NPR's Scott Horsley. We appreciate it, Scott. Thanks. You're welcome. Here's a question. Who is really supposed to be using e-cigarettes? The companies that make e-cigarettes say that they are intended for adults, a less harmful alternative to traditional cigarettes. Yet e-cigarettes have attracted non-adults, a new generation of nicotine addicts. Here's Alex Azar, the Health and Human Services Secretary. We are seeing a continued surging of middle school and high school children using e-cigarettes increasing frequency of their use, and children being drawn in by flavored e-cigarette products. So many reasons this is troublesome, and one of them is that many people who vape have reported mysterious respiratory illnesses. Now the Trump administration is planning on banning thousands of flavors used in e-cigarettes in an effort to fight teen addiction. NPR science correspondent Richard Harris is with us. Hi, Richard. Good morning. So uh, the big company in this industry is Juul. Uh, I am on their website right now looking at the flavors. We got mango, we got mint, we got fruit, we got cream. Now you can argue as to whether or not adults or kids want those things. But under the new ban, regardless, these would be out, right? They would be out. And actually, they do primarily appeal to kids. Uh, Kids go for those flavors above all others. And that's a real problem uh, because kids are smoking these vaping products more and more. The latest uh, preliminary study suggests that they're like a quarter of high schoolers are now vaping. And 25% of high schoolers? That's right. And of course, it's not just flavors in those things, but it contains addictive nicotine. So uh, going forward, the FDA has announced that it will only allow the tobacco flavored uh, products to go forward. Those are the most popular among the 8 million adults. Uh, And, you know, that so so we'll see how that plays out, whether the kids will decide, oh, if that's the only thing that's available to me, I'll go for the tobacco flavor as well. I mean, does the FDA regulate e-cigarettes the same way they do other tobacco products? 
Uh, well, the Obama administration said that the FDA should do so, uh, and as a result, it is falling under some FDA regulation. And and since these are not approved tech products, technically, it's illegal right now to market these products. But the FDA has not really uh, cracked down entirely uh, on it. They're, they've let things go forward, thinking about the adults who are still smoking these these products. But the agency is now saying, but we can step in since it's not legal to market any of these things. We're going to take the first step and uh, and get rid of the, the flavors and make the people who are uh, manufacturing the tobacco flavored one come up with with a proposal I made to say why they deserve to stay in the market as well. I mean, this is something I remember talking, interviewing the former head of the FDA, Scott Gottlieb. He was all about cracking down on vaping and e-cigarettes. It was like this personal plight for him. But why is this more aggressive move happening only now? Well, I think these numbers are kind of scary about how many kids are, are smoking. There was a lawsuit that was pushing the FDA to do more. And uh, also, uh, there's this concern about the, uh, the these weird, mysterious diseases among a small number of people who are smoking, several hundred right now. We don't know how big it's going to be. It's not clear that that's linked in any way to the flavored products, but uh, we don't actually understand exactly what it's linked to. So I think that has certainly raised this issue in the public eye, for sure. Right. And now President Trump has latched onto this as something that he's pushing. When does the ban kick in, Richard? Well, the FDA says it hopes to finalize the policy in the coming weeks, and after that, we'll see where it goes. All right, NPR's Richard Harris, science correspondent, uh, talking to us about this proposal out of the White House. President Trump says it is time to ban e-cigarettes, the flavored kind. Richard, we appreciate it. Thanks. Sure. Happy to be here. Now we know what it looks and sounds like when all the Democratic presidential contenders share the same stage. That's right. The 10 leading candidates met in Houston, Texas. Joe Biden, who's been leading in the polls, stood near the center. Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders stood to either side. Now, it would be hard to say that anybody decisively won a debate so many months before actual voting. But this event did seem to highlight genuine differences among Democrats, including those three at center stage. What were the differences? Well, NPR political reporter Asma Khalid is in Houston. Good morning, Asma. Good morning. And our senior political editor and correspondent, Domenico Montanaro, was watching too. Domenico, good morning to you. Morning, Steve. And let's start with you, Domenico. What did you see as those candidates spoke? Well, I mean, you know, the big thing here was that this was the strongest debate, at least to start, uh, for Joe Biden. He was crisper than he's been. He seemed ready to go on the attack. But he also got some help early on, and that's a big part of why he was able to kind of do better from uh, Amy Klobuchar, the senator from Minnesota. She really decided to kind of hug the moderate lane, and it seemed to put a floor under Biden, it, and it didn't wind up turning into a pylon like it has in other debates. Oh, yeah, pylon uh, Joe Biden, and instead there was this division in the Democratic Party with several candidates on either side, and Asma, something close to... I, I think close to half an hour of disagreements on a single big issue, health care. Mm -hmm. That's right. And we've seen other health care debates in the first two debates. Um, but what I think was unique about this one is that the focus of the health care conversation for much of this campaign cycle has been concentrated on the progressive left, specifically around Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All plan. Uh, last night, Biden was much more aggressive in defending his ideas around health care. And, and I want you to take a listen to a specific bite of what he had to say. I think uh, I know that the senator says she's for Bernie. Well, I'm for Barack. I think the Obamacare worked. I think the way in which we add to it, replace everything that's been cut, add a public option, guarantee that everyone will be able to have affordable assurance. I guess we should clarify. Senator says she's for Bernie. He's referring to Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren, Warren yeah. yes, exactly. And, and, you know, the Biden campaign sees this argument as a clear strength for him. You know, but look, in, in Warren world, people sort of laugh at the idea that health insurance – People like their health insurance company. They'll say people like their doctor, they like their nurse. And, and you know, the Massachusetts senator doesn't really want to take the bait, and, and specifically when Biden is pushing around this idea of taxes and costs, which is something we sure saw last night, they feel like that's an intellectually dishonest argument about whether or not taxes on the middle class will go up. They think that really you ought to look at total costs. But I would say, you know, look, a lot of lay voters aren't going to get that distinction between costs and, and taxes. It's kind of lost in the details. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I mean, what they're essentially acknowledging your taxes would go up, aren't they? But they're saying your other costs, your other health care costs would go down in many cases. So we've got uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren favoring Medicare for all. Uh, but as Domenico mentioned, Joe Biden was not the only person saying, wait a minute, let's do something a little more, a little more moderate here. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Domenico just mentioned actually specifically Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar, who defended many times this idea of health care. You know, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders has made a point of saying he wrote the the damn bill around Medicare for all. So he knows that people are mischaracterizing it. Well, here's what Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar had to say about that. While Bernie wrote the bill, I read the bill. And on page eight, on page eight of the bill, it says that we will no longer have private insurance as we know it. I don't think that's a bold idea. I think it's a bad idea. Hmm. And, and this idea of eliminating choice is something we also heard from South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who tied his idea. He has this plan called a Medicare for all who want it. And basically he says that, you know, you should trust the American voters to do what they want and have the sense to choose what they opt for. Okay, so quite substantive debate there. Maybe not a lot that was new, but people could sit there and look at the differences between the candidates. Now, we mentioned that there were 10 Democrats on stage, but sometimes it seemed almost like there were 11. Let's listen. I want to give credit first to Barack Obama for really bringing us this far. We, would we all owe a huge debt to President Obama, who fundamentally transformed health care in America. Uh, and of course, uh, we owe a debt of gratitude to President Barack Obama. Uh, Domenico, it sounds like President Obama had a pretty good debate. <laughs> Uh, it's quite a difference from what we've heard in past debates when they've been pretty critical of Obama's tenure as not progressive enough. Uh, you know, and those newly warm feelings tell me they recognize Biden is still in the lead and just how important older black voters who've been really supporting Biden uh, are to who wins this nomination. I mean, President Obama is still very popular within the Democratic Party, and a lot of voters who we've talked to on the campaign trail sort of chafed at this idea that they were just sort of dismissing him. Him, especially with President Trump in the White House, they're saying, well, how far do they want to go? Uh, we kind of liked what President Obama had to do. I guess we should be explicit about this. Of course, Joe Biden, having been Barack Obama's vice president, is the most naturally associated with Obama's record. Well, and he's wrapped himself in President Obama and everyone else has sort of ceded the lane, which was kind of jaw dropping, to be totally honest. There was also a difference last night on gun laws. Beto O'Rourke, a uh, Democrat of Texas, noted early on that his city, El Paso, just suffered a mass shooting just weeks ago, and he was pretty definite about assault-style rifles. Hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15, your AK-47. We're not going to allow it to be used against our fellow Americans anymore. Asma, what does O'Rourke want to do, and how does that compare to the other candidates on stage? So he's proposing a mandatory gun buyback program. And Steve, you know, you heard that that line was so enthusiastically received in the debate hall. But that, that just shows you it's really popular, maybe with the activist base of the Democratic Party. Uh, most of the candidates do agree on some sort of version of a voluntary gun buyback program. But O'Rourke is going further with this mandatory idea. Um, you know, I, I think what's really interesting is that when you look at the broader electorate, Mandatory gun buybacks are really controversial. A, a recent NPR PBS NewsHour Marist poll found that 46 percent of Americans are against Congress passing such legislation. Forty five percent are in favor. And mm. really, the divide splits along partisan lines. Domenico, one other question for you. We've talked about the five or six leading candidates. Did anybody yep. a little bit further down in the polls stand out? Well, you know, you look at O'Rourke. I mean, he certainly was in kind of re full reboot, reboot mode of his uh, candidacy. Candidacy, and all these other candidates are starting to sort of feel the heat. And they were really trying some Hail Marys. You had Andrew Yang with this competition uh, to give out $1,000 to 10 different people. Uh, Amy Klobuchar went for broke in the moderate lane. You had Julian Castro forcefully going after Joe Biden at several turns. So you had a lot of these candidates realizing that uh, votes are going to be cast shortly and had to take some risks last night. Domenico and Asma Khalid, thanks so much. You're welcome. That's You're welcome. In, that's NPR's Domenico's Montanaro and NPR's Asma Khalid. The Trump administration is changing what qualifies as the waters of the United States. 
The head of the Environmental Protection Agency signed off on the repeal of an Obama-era regulation. For many years, federal law has aimed to limit pollution in lakes and rivers. The administration of President Obama extended that rule in ways that would regulate pollution on wetlands and smaller waterways. They were to be regulated in part because they flow into the bigger waterways. EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler argued that rolling back that rule would reassure farmers and home builders and landowners. NPR's Nate Rott is covering this story for us, and he's on the line. Nate, good morning. Hey, Steve. What was the regulation exactly? So what they're scrapping is a regulation that was finalized in the waning days of the Obama administration called the Waters of the U.S. Rule, or WOTUS for short. Okay. Uh, because, you know, as well as I do, Steve, that a, every federal policy is only as strong as its acronym. That's not the um, strongest acronym, I got to no, tell you. It's but not, anyway, no. go on. Go on. Uh, basically, what the Waters of the United States did was it tried to define which river, streams, wetlands, and lakes should deserve protection under the Clean Water Act. Uh, the Clean Water Act itself largely limits pollution in big natural navigable waterways. That's the term in the actual statute. Mm -hmm. But court decisions, including a ruling from the Supreme Court, left the door open for protections to expand off of those bigger waterways. So you said not just the river, but the stream that feeds into it or the wetland next to it. And Obama wanted to basically officially extend federal water protections to that larger connected water system with this regulation. I guess we should just underline the basic problem here is gravity. You want to protect the rivers, the big rivers. You want to protect the big lakes, but essentially all land. I mean, everything flows downhill into something. And so how do you how far do you extend that protection inland? Why did the Trump administration consider Obama's approach to be a power grab? Well, you know, this change was not terribly popular with a number of groups, farmers, developers, miners. You know, they saw this as they did many Obama environmental regulations as a federal land grab and an overreach of what the Clean Water Act was actually intended to do. Uh, and look, the rule certainly expanded federal water protections to new waterways, uh, but was a, I think was as is the case with a lot of these policies one way or the other, uh, there's a lot of rhetoric where the on the ground impact is a little harder to discern. Um, part of that in this rule is because it was immediately challenged in court by some of the groups that we just mentioned. Uh, and the Trump administration was clear from its start that this rule was one of its top environmental targets. Uh, so in some ways it was kind of a dead rule walking. Oh, so we never really found out how much landowners and other people might have been affected had this rule been fully implemented. No, it was only implemented in 2015 and, and, and was challenged by a number of states. So do we have any sense now of how landowners and other people will be affected now that the rule is conclusively dead? Again, hard to say. Uh, you know, those groups are groups are thrilled by this decision. EPA chief Andrew Wheeler announced his repeal, you know, to applause at the National Association of Manufacturers headquarters yesterday. Um, but this rule, like many of the Trump administration's regulatory rollbacks, is going to be challenged in court. Hmm. And so at the end of the day, uh, the impact is probably going to be discerned uh, by a court decision. Very briefly, is my drinking water supposed to be affected by this? Again, hard to say. You know, in the media, uh, the federal water protections are going to revert back to where they were in 1986. But the Trump administration is also making its own water rule, which would basically try to provide its own definition for waters of the U.S. Uh, unsurprisingly, it's a lot less than what the Obama administration had envisioned. NPR's Nate Rott, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Steve.